My name is Adam G. I'm a commissioning editor at um, Red Bull Media House, where I primarily commission short form non sport documentaries. Um, latterly, I've been commissioning uh, mid form documentaries at Little Dot Studios for um, Real Stories Channel. And prior to that, I was a commissioner for Eons at Channel 4, including um, setting up their factual short form. Um, service and um, what I wanted to do today is really kind of draw attention to the different sources of funding for short form and um, in that exploring a little bit about the um, the the sort of tips and tricks of um, of creating short form and also a sense of where it's going um, as, a, as a form or, or medium um, so the distinguished panel here kind of represents five different kinds of short form funding. So um, at the far end, uh, I'm sure you've um, come across him in all sorts of ways here and elsewhere. Um, Charlie Phillips, who's um, head of video at The Guardian. And um, he's really representing um, commissions, um, in his case from a um, media organization rather than a, a broadcaster. Um, then next up, we've got Hannah Bailey, who's from the BFI uh, Doc Society Fund. And um, she is here really to sort of represent um, grant funding, public money, foundations, that kind of funding. So another sort of um, dimension of commissions. Um, thirdly, we've got Erica Edwards from the Lush Film Fund. Um, and she's the fund manager there, and that is clearly um, brand money um, being used for short form in a particular sort of territory. Uh, next, we've got Brandon Wade um, from 0.51 Productions and Royal Holloway uh, University of London, uh, and he's a specialist in crowdfunding. And then finally, we've got um, Catherine um, Bray, and um, she is both the co-founder of an indie, uh, a very interesting imaginative indie called Loop. And she, to some extent, is going to um, represent self-funding and the role that that can play in getting projects up and running. But also, she has another hat on, which is that of commissioning editor of Random Acts, um, which is run on behalf of um, Channel 4 by Little Dot Studios. Um, so she's um, also going to cover um, that territory. So a second commissioner, bookended by commissioners, um, but in this case from a broadcaster. Um, so I'd like to start at the Charlie end um, and just ask you, Charlie, if you could um, just explain um, the kind of short form that The Guardian is making um, at present and how journalistic or otherwise it is. Sure, so uh, we have a strand of short docs that are on the longer end of shorts. Our films are generally 15 to 30 minutes, um, and sometimes even slightly longer than 30 minutes now. Um, what we want to do is stuff that works both as creative documentary and also as video journalism. Um, so they need to look and feel like ambitious observational documentaries, but they need to speak in the broader sense to a news agenda, to social and political importance. It needs to be something that you, that you understand why you're watching it on The Guardian. So it needs to be saying something new and surprising about the world around us. Um, we um, want to do stuff that is complementing what the rest of The Guardian does um, rather than duplicating it. So obviously we have a whole load of people who work inside The Guardian, across all media, who are breaking stories, who are doing um, uh, access-driven journalism. Um, the documentaries we do are deliberately about working with external people, so people who can come to us with very deep access uh, to communities and stories that they are deeply embedded in, where they can tell a very authentic kind of story. Um, that's the test that things have to pass when people come to us is is this something that only you could do rather than something we could do in-house 
at The Guardian. Um, and the reason that we do films that are on the longer side of short is because we want to try and do stuff that has a complete story arc as far as possible. So it takes you on a journey because it's got a beginning, a middle and an end. It might well be character based and we want people to have to commit the time to really getting immersed deeply into, into a story. Okay, um, that might be a good moment just to look at your um, clip reel just to get a feel for what that looks like in real life. Mm -hmm. So could we see the first uh, reel please? Lovely. So that gives us um, a good kind of feel for uh, where the Guardian's at. Now, one of the films that we saw in there was um, Black Sheep, mm -hmm. which um, was Oscar nominated this year. Congratulations. Amazing. Yeah. Um, could you tell us a little bit about how that came into being and in particular how it was funded? Sure. So that, that came about from Ed Perkins, who is the director who I've known for a few years just coming to have a general chat with me about stuff he was working on. Um, and one of the last ideas he mentioned, sort of at the end of like an hour long meeting, was that he'd just met this guy called Cornelius, who had a really interesting backstory. And it just sounded really fascinating. And Ed came back almost immediately with an idea of the style of the film, uh, which for people who haven't seen it, is a mix of um, recreations of Cornelius's backstory um, with him doing the to camera very direct address thing and um, it just sounded amazing we got excited very quickly um, we put in a bit more money to it than we would normally do um, so about two-thirds of the funding came from The Guardian and then um, there was a little bit that Lightbox the production company put in themselves and then a bit of money from the Filmmaker Fund, which is a kind of a philanthropic fund for documentaries of lots of different lengths. Um, so it all came together. Um, the budget was higher than quite a few of the other films we would normally do, but it was still a very lean budget for a film of that ambition because it's a film of, um, I think it's 25 minutes, I can't remember. Um, a 25 minute film of that sort of cinematic quality, but we, we knew right from the off that this was something that we would enter into awards. Um, it was something that I thought we'd try and get Oscar nominated from, almost from when Ed first told me about it, mm. right at that conceptual stage. So we really put a lot of weight behind it. And how come Lightbox were involved? Is he in the, um, so Ed, ten, Ed makes his work through Lightbox. Right. He's on a retainer with right. them. Um, and obviously that was an exciting thing for us as well because Simon Chin um, is himself an Oscar winning producer and having his heft behind it um, was something really exciting for us as well. Yeah. Um, can you give us an idea of how many short form films you're making this year and probably next year? Just, just so we, do, we do about 20 a year but it's quite a flexible thing because it, it depends on how our money can stretch and also whether we can work with other people who can put in money as well to partner with us. Uh, so one of the joys of being an online platform is that it's not like you're having to put stuff out in a 9pm slot 52 weeks a year, so you can't do more than 52. Um, it, it's an average of 20 to 25 a year, but we could do more if, if the money was there. Um, but that, that sort of 20-ish films a year tends to work quite well for us, being able to promote them properly on The Guardian and put a lot of love into the marketing. Right, lovely. Um, move on to Hannah. So you're at BFI Doc Society yep. Fund, um, and you've just reopened your short-form funding. Yes. Can you tell us a bit about that? Of course. Um, we've reopened the short-form uh, the funding for the short film on Friday um, and you can find all the inner details on our website but we uh, will be looking to commission um, 10 short films again this year it's an open call application process uh, we're looking for creative documentaries bold social and cultural ambitions um, and we're broad in the sense of they can be personal films they can be essay docs, they can be uh, art house, uh, journalistic or character driven pieces, um, social justice, you know, social issue documentaries, um, up to 40 minutes in length um, and we grant up to 15,000 for each of those projects. 
Um, and the fund is, uh, I think it's a great opportunity. We're really looking for, it is a new and emerging talent fund and um, looking for all the people in other sectors of the, of the arts who are moving into documentary as a form of storytelling. Um, and we're really looking at new voices and diverse voices from across the regions and the nations, very much so out of London. Um, those with you know, creative, ambitious, new ways of telling that story that doesn't have to be a completely unknown story, but something that's got really great access, um, a new visual approach, a new way of telling that story. Um, I think something that's really key and that you picked up on, Charlie, is uh, why are you the right person to tell that story and why now? Um, and we asked for a, a one minute video from the director in our application form to explain this and your kind of intentions behind the film and why you want to make it. And I can't stress how valuable that is for us as a team to really gain an insight. There's certain things you can't kind of put on paper. Um, so that's, that's really important. We've just, uh, last year we funded 10 films. Um, two of them have just premiered, but they did that on Saturday um, here at the festival, which we're really proud. Um, some of them are still, still in, in the thick of it, um, kind of finishing off, um, but we've had five of them finished now, and we're hoping that they will get out onto the, onto the festival. So um, is this, is this the second year in total? or This will be our second this year. This is the second year. Yeah, so this is the second year. So taking a lot of what we learnt from last year as well. And they really are different. I mean, we have a, uh, everything from a, a five-minute animation um, to a 40-minute very journalistic piece. Uh, but they tend to be in the kind of 12 to 20-minute right. mark. Um, it might be a good time to show the... Yes, let's do that. Yeah, this is, so this is a... Um, trailer from one of the shorts we funded last year. That's actually directors in the room, Francie, and it was uh, shown here on Saturday. It's with the masses. That's <laughs> it's great. I love that film. It's a visceral portrait of three South Londoners and their connection to their respective religions, Islam, Christianity and football. And, yeah, all, all set in Bermondsey, and it's, we're very proud of that film. Um, how do your films get distributed? Um, we made quite a conscious decision not to go down a set distribution route and get a broadcast partner involved. Um, so it is a combination of the producers working and us as a fund and bringing in our experience to get the films out there in the world and seen and we're quite interested to see how that will play out with these first 10 films. Yeah. Um, obviously there's a, there's a key aim to kind of get them into the big, big festivals here in the UK and internationally. Um, one of the films uh, is likely to get a distribution deal on Nat Geo, one of the longer films, right. um, which is exciting and that's something that the producer has worked very hard on. Um, and then with some of the films as well, we don't, I should mention, we don't have to fully finance yeah. um, our films. And we have, we have a film that we've been working on with The Guardian and, and other partners. Um, and there are also, uh, if we feel a film might be right for an online platform such as Nowness, um, we can kind of help facilitate that conversation with the filmmakers and with the people there and um, get them out and get them seen. Lovely. Um, if you take the example of the masses, do, do you know how that's going to get out and about into the world? Well, it's just premiered at Sheffield, yep. isn't it, Dot? And Dot's have been having a, a, a couple of conversations. At the moment, it, we're looking at the film festival strategy right. and getting that out. Um, and then we'll speak about its online life after that, right. I think. Lovely. OK. Um, if we can move on to you, Erica. Um, can you give us a sense of why Lush is involved making short form programs? Well, Lush as a company is a family owned business. It's still owned by the same family in Dorset who founded it 23 years ago. Um, it was literally founded in their garden, in a, in a shed where bath bombs were first made. So it's really family owned business. And they, the couple that own it have always cared about um, activism and grassroots groups and campaigning and storytelling. And you've probably noticed and seen in the press various campaigns that Lush have 
put in their shop windows. They'll use this spot on the high street to kind of highlight issues that they care about. Um, so the film fund is almost an extension of that. So getting stories out there that might otherwise not get told, uh, from stories that with an ethical background, I know we, we use the term ethics, it's really they're quite subjective, but um, stories that uh, matter to the company, um, uh, stories that will make the viewers think about something, perhaps um, have a change in perception or look at things a bit differently. Um, so that's the kind of stories that we tell, and it's really, it's quite broad really, um, we've done everything from a three-minute dance film about knife crime um, to... Uh, we do features as well, but as we're just talking about shorts here, we've done um, a couple of co-productions with The Guardian, including uh, Little Pyongyang, which is about North Korean defectors. Um, so it's really super broad and lots of different things. We've done. And, and how do you feel it works for the brand? I think it's worked really well for the brand because um, it also shows our customers how we really care about these stories um, and obviously it gets more people to look at what we're doing. It opens us up to a completely different audience as well. Mm. Um, and I've had some really nice feedback from people at the festival who, you know, a lot, everybody will say to me, oh, I didn't know Lush did that. And that's really nice to hear. Okay. Uh, it's surprising, I think. Let's have a wee look at the um, video just so we can see, uh, so get a feel for this more. Okay, so we've got a sense of the sort of scope of what you cover. Um, can you sort of, I know that's like choosing between babies, but can you <laughs> um, pick out a kind of something that represents a sort of a gold standard for what you're trying to do? Yeah, I mean, uh, Little Pyongyang, as I mentioned a moment ago, is one that um, really stands out for us as well. It was an example of a great collaboration um, with The Guardian, and also I think the, the way that it was published um, worked really well both for us and for the filmmaker. Because we're a brand and we have that quite broad audience, uh, putting it out on our platforms, I think, um, opened up the film perhaps to some new people. Uh, we have a screening space at our studio in Soho as well, so when the film was released we screened it there um, and we did a panel discussion afterwards on the topics raised in the film which was live streamed alongside articles on our website, social media updates and um, interviews with the director. So I was really happy with the kind of package of content and the way that we distributed it. Um, and of course the film screened at festivals, it screened at Sheffield last year, um, so it was just a really um, nice way that we put it out there and the topic was um, really important to um, and I think changed people's perception towards um, North Korean refugees. So we can already see from what you've said that uh, this is brand funded documentary is not about pack shots or logos all over the place it's quite an oblique connection between the business and the kind of content that you're putting out there. Yeah absolutely I mean I can only speak from from our brand um, so I don't know how how other people do it, but certainly I know that it's because people genuinely care about getting these stories out there, and we wouldn't do something. I mean, it's almost a turn off for us if something comes, if we get applications that have you know huge names attached and things like that, because that film is going to pick up funding somewhere else. We're more interested in kind of the the, the more subtle stories that are going to be more impactful ultimately. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, Brandon, can we move on to you? Um, some people think that um, you can sort of build uh, a crowdfunding campaign, whack it up there online, and they will come. Is that true? Uh, unfortunately, no. Um, it's kind of like what you put in is what you get out of it. Uh, thank you guys all for being here. It's lovely to hear from all of you so far. And for a long time, I kind of viewed you guys as, as the gatekeepers to funding for, for works and, and things. And if and if you're lucky enough to receive that funding, it's, it's an amazing thing. I, I personally haven't been a recipient of that, and there's no ill uh, will here. But, um, <laughs> but I'm, curious, I'm curious to hear from you guys. Like, just let's start by, raise your hand if you have heard of crowdfunding. I know it sounds obvious, but raise your hand if you've heard of crowdfunding. Okay, good. Now keep up. Okay, put your hand up if you have been a recipient of funding from any scheme in the past. That's actually better than I thought. Okay. <laughs> But for the rest of you that are still trying to like break into that uh, source of funding and maybe even using it as I did as an excuse or a hindrance, uh, well, once I get the funding and I get my break, I'll, I'll make my movie, you know. Um, I kind of, I guess I had maybe five years of that and I 
kind of got a road down by it and I just decided, you know what, there's another way to raise funds for my own project. So um, through crowdfunding, you can essentially put together all the pieces that you would put together for an application um, and instead of kind of submitting it uh, to a panel of judges, you submit it to the people, you know, friends, family, and strangers. And uh, as long as you keep breathing life into that thing, you can get returns. And that's kind of what I liked about it was, whereas I would send off an application, wait three months, biting my teeth doing nothing, and then get a rejection, I would instead put up a, a campaign, spend a month treating it like a full-time job, and then hopefully, you know, make it to the finish line and see the results I wanted. Can you give us um, some ideas of the sort of sums that you've raised through crowdfunding? Sure, um, they're not huge sums, but uh, in the US, so I, I lived in California for about 10 years uh, in LA working in the industry, and out there it's a, a big thing, crowdfunding. Uh, so I raised uh, about 33,000 US dollars for a film project that's about equality, it's called Equitism, you'll see some clips on there. And then when I came out here, kind of had to reset my networks and my contacts, so I went for half of that, roughly half that sum, and I got about 15,000 pounds uh, for a production company that's about equal opportunities. So I think with crowdfunding, it's just, you have to find that, that sweet spot of being ambitious but not looking for too much. And there's obviously different routes you can take because if you go with Indiegogo or, or some other uh, programs, you can have a flexible campaign, and if you don't reach your goal, you'll still get a portion of the funding, but then they'll take a larger amount um, Indiegogo will take a larger amount. Whereas Kickstarter, which I've focused on primarily, you have to reach your goal or you get none of it. So the pressure's on, but then I think people also recognize the pressure and they're like, oh, I've got to help you make it, you know, if you really care. You know? Can you tell us a bit about but the role of badges or pins sure, in crowdfunding? <laughs> sure, so you'll see again a little bit in the video. Um, so everybody here has collected their complimentary tote bag and um, these kind of things are great, right? Uh, You'll see on campaigns all the time, tote bags, t-shirts, mugs, and there's a, there are kind of generic things. Usually people will throw in a fiver or maybe even 10 for, for an item like that, but uh, they say that the ideal amount is 20 quid for, for someone to donate. Like if, they're, if they like your idea, but they don't like it enough to break the bank, they'll give you 20, 20 pounds. So you want to find an item that has a significance, a unique significance. Um, in our case, we, we created a badge, like a pin, and it was tied into the message. So it uh, allowed you to express different things about yourself. You could, you could rotate different parts of the pin and you could express what gender you identify with. You could express what gender you're attracted to. You could express if you're in a relationship, if you're not in a relationship, if you're looking for a relationship. So it was all about consent, um, acceptance, and basically equality. And so that really kind of started uh, creating a community of its own. And we had people coming from other campaigns um, that were just obsessed with pins. You know, there's a whole community of, I mean, I don't know, but they're there. <laughs> and, uh, and they found it and, you know, and they would just, they would just pay for the pin. They, they weren't even concerned about the film we were making. So if you find a little clever thing like that, because the reward system is important, um, and at festivals I'm sure you'll see sometimes people passing out these little items to promote their films. It was kind of something like that. Um, and it helped us to, to gain some momentum. Yeah, so, I mean, it might seem cosmetic, but it's not really that stuff can really make a big difference. Yeah. 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 Um, why is your company called 0.51? Yeah, so again, the video will tell you a bit about that, but uh, we, we just believed very strongly in this uh, interesting point uh, of having equality across the board. Uh, so with our productions, we have over 50% women. Um, obviously, we're trying to get a nice balance, but it's hard to get exactly 50%. And we were, we were not going to uh, accept less than 50%. So we went just for 0.51. And we've had a huge success. We just did a short film with that uh, 15K that we raised. And it's about mental health. It's kind of a young woman's coming of age story. And we also have um, over 50% of women on the key creative roles. So we had Caroline Bridges from Illuminatrix uh, shoot, the, uh, shoot the project. We had a female writer, female producers, and um, I, I directed it and I also edited it mainly to save on, on costs. Sure, good. Yeah. So I'm glad we are 50-50 and with Catherine's extra It's a lovely uh, 0.51, um, just over into the female area. Um, let's have a look at your film, um, please. Brilliant. Okay. Um, Moving on to Catherine, um, 
I want to just to ask you a little bit about how you have used self-funded projects to get the ball rolling um, within some of the sort of loop productions. Um, so I think the first thing to do is sort of say that obviously there's self-funding and self-funding, there's, uh, there's your hard costs where you actually have to spend money and then there's also the sort of the soft thing of research and, and staff time and, you know, Charlie going to a, an, the leather archive in Chicago or whatever um, to kind yeah. of kick off a project. With the, with the self-funding hard costs, that comes from the way that we run our company, which is a bit different from how I think a lot of indies work. Uh, with our sort of bigger budget projects, which are obviously not, with a, like, we're not talking about the Avengers, we're talking about a sort of low budget thing for BBC Two or for a feature length thing for the iPlayer. Um, so not massive budgets in the grand scheme of filmmaking, but big budgets in terms of us, a little film company of three people. And when we've got a project like that, what we'll do is we'll save the production fee. I'm sure you all know this, but on any project of any size, the Indie takes a production fee. Um, payment for their work aside from the money that's, um, that you spend on making the project. So we'll always take our production fee and put that in the company coffers, effectively for a rainy day. So the first, um, to give you a kind of more specific example, the first kind of bigger project that we did was a half hour for BBC Two. It was this mad poetry documentary using a 1997 episode of EastEnders as a vehicle for exploring a car crash that uh, a poet had got into in on the night that that episode was transmitted. So fair play to BBC Two for commissioning that. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we had about a 30K production fee on that. We put that away uh, in the Loop Bank account. And you know, we were doing our end of year accounts and the guy who does that said, well, what you should do as company directors is pay yourself a dividend. What's that? pay yourself some money and keep it. We're like, well, I mean, great, but that's not really why we set up the company. So we decided with that 30K, what we would do is give away 15 of it to other filmmakers who might be sort of struggling with short form projects that they couldn't get funded elsewhere. Like we were particularly interested in stuff that might sort of slightly fall through the cracks in terms of what was available elsewhere. So we gave away the 15K, uh, called that the Loop Fund. Um, we're just getting through some of the sort of finished projects that resulted from that now. So that's really exciting. And then the other 15, there's three of us, myself, Charlie Lyne and Anthony Ng. And we said, well, that's 5K each for, to self-fund whatever project those three people are interested in making. And I mean, Charlie, I think, is working on a 60 minute, uh, we haven't announced this yet, I shouldn't say. He's working on a 60 minute, very arty thing. And that's what he's doing with his 5K. Um, I haven't spent mine yet because I've been too busy running random acts. And Anthony made his first narrative short. So that's sort of one example of how we've yeah. used self-funding. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I, I was thinking, you know, it was, a, it was a very interesting year this year because um, how, how many people saw Minding the Gap? Well, did it show last year here at Charlie? Yeah. 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 How, how many people have seen Minding the Gap? Okay, not tons. I would really recommend that you um, do your best to see that. It was screened here uh, last year and the director um, being new... Um, came and um, it was nominated for the uh, feature doc um, Oscar this year um, yes that's right yes um, and um, the thing about it was that it started as a short form skateboarding film and it ended up as a feature doc about domestic violence um, and it's a very good example of where uh, self-funding in the, in the shape of literally labour and time and effort and uh, not cash um, was part of a sort of iterative process that went from short form through to feature length um, and I think a lot of people use that kind of sweat equity type um, approach to just get the ball rolling so they can leverage other people's money um, so on the one hand, you can have that kind of iterative approach that starts with um, self-funded stuff. On the other hand, I think I'd want to sort of get away from the notion that there's some sort of hierarchy uh, as there is in scripted short form, where you, know, you make a short film so that you can go on to make a feature. I, I, I don't really espouse that view. What do you think of that view, Charlie? 
Do you, is it a stepping stone or is it something else? Yeah, I don't think of it as a stepping stone at mm. all. I, I think the, the short doc is an art form in itself. Yeah. Um, and is partly because Netflix has put a lot of money into shorts, I think it's got a, a reputation and a quality all of its own. Um, and for some people, yeah, it might mean that you then go on to make features, but I think if you start out just seeing it as a stepping stone, it's such a kind of disservice to mm. short form as a thing in itself. Because the, as I'm sure everyone knows, the length of a theatrical film is because that was the length of reels in the cinema. Uh, 52 minute on TV is because you need ad breaks, but we live in an age where people can watch anything on any devices anywhere, so things can be whatever length they, they need to be. Yeah. Um, on the Netflix front, what's your favourite um, short that they've commissioned thus far? Is there anything that stands out for you? Uh, well, I really love The White Helmets, which is one of the first shorts they yeah. did that um, Orlando and Ronan Siegel made. I think that is a really incredible piece of work, which is 40 minutes. Um, that film could so easily have ended up being 90, but they wanted to make it as impactful as possible and get it out as quickly yeah. as possible. I mean, just to clarify for people, you know, just the very definition of um, uh, shorts. I mean, if you're, if you're the American Academy, um, then it's 40 minutes, isn't it? Anything sub 40 minutes is a short. Um, in my life, it's something that's more like five minutes. Um, you know, there, there are lots of different ways of, um, of defining it, really. But I think, um, um, well, what, what do you think, for example, if, if someone asks you what is a short for? short form programme, what is it for you? I mean, I think and hope that eventually we'll just move away from kind of trying to categorise them like that anyway, yeah. because as you say, I mean, okay, I was out at Cannes this year and I saw this amazing 60 minute film mm. and I sort of pitched it to Sight and Sound. I was like, look, I mean, it is playing as a short, but it seems so arbitrary that something that's 75 minutes long will get a review in Sight and Sound and this film, which is incredible and I have loads to say about wouldn't get a review and they were really good and sort of heard that logic and, and let me write about it mm. and I mean I saw all of the in, the competition shorts this year at Cannes it was everything from sort of five minutes to half an hour best thing I saw last year was 50 minutes long and sort of production values far above and beyond a lot of the kind of 90 minute films that you see yeah. so I think it is all starting to sort of blend much yeah. more and, and formats are blending as well the 60 minute film that blew me away was this really weird mixture of very documentary, conventional, talking heads type stuff with sort of scripted reality with kind of totally fictional se sequences. Mm. And it was made by this guy who works as a trucker in Japan and saves up his money and then goes off and makes a short, a, a film that then plays in sort of Locarno and then he goes back to being a trucker. So he had a totally different sense of what is possible in the film mm -hmm. world. And he'd been commissioned to make a 10 minute promotional short for a Buddhist monastery and then had turned in this thing. I mean, don't know what the monastery made of it, but it was absolutely amazing. Yeah. I mean, at the risk of embarrassing someone in the audience, but um, <coughs> she was referenced earlier on, um, Dorothy that directed um, The Masses uh, made um, a four minute film, I don't know, like a couple of years ago or maybe last year, um, about uh, depression uh, called The Mess. Um, and I would really sort of challenge anyone to make a 90-minute film that said anything more about depression than her perfectly sort of conceived, perfectly executed four-minute film does. So um, that's a good one to have a look at if, um, if you haven't seen it already, but it's, it's a very good example of why um, thinking of shorts as a sort of stepping stone is kind of misguided. Yeah. Um, obviously... Online in particular, it's a pretty noisy world. Um, how do you get stuff to punch through? So, for example, from the point of view of Lush, um, what can you do to really make sure your films are heard and seen and, and, and get through that noise? Um, well, for us, it's about the sort of promotion around the films as well. So currently, um, anything that... We find, well, we work with filmmakers on films we fund to kind of agree when we're going to have them on the platform. But we have our own separate video platform at the moment. Sometime in the future, it's going to be merged into an all-singing, all-dancing website. I don't know how much I'm allowed to say about that. But um, that's the plan in the future. But really, to get them seen, I think it's, it's about, like I say, what's around it. So we will do screenings where possible. Um, I also program a, a very small film festival in our studio once a year. 
um, which has been really nice. So we did the second year last year, so hopefully there'll be a third year this year. Um, we have writers that write articles, because working for a brand, I'm really lucky that we've got all these different resources that I can tap into. So writers, photographers, um, we do podcasts as well, so perhaps it's like putting... Um, a podcast out there, direct interview with the director, and just hitting all those different people who like to consume their information in different ways. Um, we also don't have social media anymore as of like, last month, um, so that's going to be an interesting new challenge for us. Um, <laughs> trying wow. <to> wow. <laughs> yeah, the, I think we're the first sort of big brands to come off social media, but that's a whole other conversation. Not here. Yeah. Um, <coughs> yeah, that's oh, interesting. Well, going from the sublime to the ridiculous, let's. Mm. Um, Go to Charlie. Like, so you've got a, a big sort of media organisation behind you. How do you get your stuff to sort of punch through? So yeah, so we're really lucky that we've got this massive shop window on the front of the Guardian website, which is one of the most visited websites in the world, and we've got massive social media following. So there's a kind of natural marketing tool in there. Um, but actually, because, because people's behaviour isn't necessarily to go to the front of the Guardian or even to kind of follow every tweet from the Guardian, there's a lot of stuff that we try and do around um, subject specific promotion and trying to get advocates to, uh, to help promote our films. There's also the, the fact that we get really, that, that most of our audience is directly on YouTube because The Guardian Video Player is a YouTube player um, and the number of subscribers on there and the way the YouTube algorithm works, especially for an org organisation like us that's a preferred partner of Google actually means that increasingly the, the films sort of start to promote themselves because YouTube is pushing them into people's feeds, mm. um, which is a weird thing really because it feels totally out of our control, yeah. but um, they, because YouTube wants to be seen to be a kind of credible news source rather than a sewer for the worst <laughs> behaviour of people, um, we're, we're sort of riding that wave of them wanting to push quality content into people's feeds. Well, Adam, that's um, something you should really talk about mm. with real stories, um, right? Like, this yeah. is this amazing YouTube channel that yeah. does docs and um, has billions of views. So, Real Stories is um, a dedicated documentary channel. Um, it was built up on acquisitions, um, but in the last couple of years has um, uh, funded original content. Um, and it's quite interesting because, obviously, um, an interesting sort of comparison with The Guardian just in the sense that it's privately held indie, but it publishes five billion views worth of video content, Little Dot Studios as a whole, mm. um, every month. So that's an immense amount of data and immense ability to be able to track the vagaries of, um, of YouTube and the changes in the algorithms that, as Charlie was explaining, kind of push things. Um, and a lot of focus at Real Stories is in um, finding ways to kind of amplify the impact of um, documentaries in all sorts of ways. Sometimes it's around PR, sometimes it's around optimizing um, how things perform online. Um, but in spite of its kind of scale, it's a, it's a constant challenge and you have to work very hard to make sure that what you've made actually gets seen. Um, we should just return briefly to um, random acts because we haven't really touched on that yet. Um, could you give a sort of sense of where you're at commissioning now um, with, with random acts? And just um, some people might not be entirely familiar with exactly what it is, so just if you can explain. Yeah, sure. So um, Random Acts was set up in 2011, making it a bit of a grandmother on the UK short scene or maybe more of a fun auntie, that kind of thing. <laughs> um, it was set up by Tabitha Jackson, who's now at Sundance, to kind of liven up the short form art scene in the UK. She felt like there's loads of telly about artists and not enough telly that's being made by artists. Obviously, the scene has changed a lot since then, but in 2011, um, that kind of excluded what, we would, what they would have then traditionally thought of as documentary. We've changed, I think, because um, as we were talking about before, there's a lot of sort of collapse between what sort of different formats are. There's less sort of ghettoization of the different art forms. So what I do now is I do commission a certain amount of what I would call documentary, but what a traditional telecommissioner probably wouldn't think of as documentary, or might not anyway. 
Um, we do about 50 short films a year now. Um, traditionally, again, it, they were very sort of strictly three to four minutes long. That's something I'm also sort of pushing a little bit. We'll do things that are a bit longer. Uh, I mean, rarely over six minutes, but it just does just depend on what the kind of runtime that suits the film is. Our budgets are quite small, so there's not a sort of big advantage in going massively long and spreading the cash too thin for us. Um, something that we want to do more of, and I guess is probably not massively known about us, is collaborations with other funders. So we've done one with BFI Network this year where they put in 10K, we put in 4K. The film feels very random acts in tone, like it's this completely mad thing about a world reconstructed from the child's drawings that have been preserved in a time capsule and then like, a thousand years later aliens have found them and used them to sort of make a new version of society. So that's very classically random act in terms of taste, but it really needed a bit more budget to kind of get it over the line with the sort of production values that we felt it deserved. So we've done a collab with you guys. Mm. Thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs> um, should we have a look at your reel just so we've got a sense of the sort of scope of... Sure, and I should say it's not a traditional reel, this because our reel kind of covers all of the different disciplines we do, dance, animation, um, everything so for this we've just put together a few clips of the films that fall more into the area of documentary for us hopefully although i guess it might not be evident at this length they all do something a bit different with the either with the form or the way that the content relates to the notion of documentary so i think the real starts for example with a film about the struggles of being a freelance filmmaker uh, this constructed from stock footage that Duncan Cowles shot in an attempt to make money as a freelance filmmaker. So there's a kind of like a meta thing going on there. What's the name of that film? That's Taking Stock. Taking uh, Stock, absolutely brilliant. Definitely check it out if you haven't seen it already. That was commissioned here actually. Like Duncan came up to me at a Sheffield drinks thing and said I've got this idea and I was like that sounds amazing. Let's have a, let's have a meeting. Cool, let's watch it. So films um, by artists rather than about artists, does that still hold good? Yes, so that last thing, uh, Tom Dale, amazing visual artist, you should check him out. I'm not sure we've done him justice with that clip, but um, he does things like, I don't know what they're called, you know those um, paint strip things you get in B&Q with the different shades of colours? So he made a massive one of those with all the shades of blue, hung it off the back of a plane and flew it over the country so you could see which colour of blue the sky in the background corresponded to at any one time. So he does stuff like that, he's great. Um, yeah, so it's, uh, it's not quite sort of traditional docs, but um, we do collaborate and sort of hook people up with other people if an idea comes in and it's amazing, like I would pass it to Real Stories or to Charlie. Lovely, um, that might be a really good um, point to start taking some of your questions and observations. So don't be um, shy. Um, hands up. Have we got some mics and stuff? Yeah, we have. Good. Um, over to you. So there's a lady at the back there. Um, is there a question for you? Um, oh, if you're saying people are sending in ideas and it seems very um, easy to get in that way, but how many ideas do you get sent to you? Or like, Who is that to? Um, oh. Everyone. <laughs> uh, yeah, and Catherine Bray, and to everyone. Um, it's a bit of a depressing ratio, I'll have to be honest, but uh, I think we get in about, I would say it's about 500 a month, something like that. Um, but you have to bear in mind that a lot of them are people sitting there sending the same out idea out to like 100 funds. Kind of credible, interesting, good ideas, the number is quite a bit smaller. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it speaks to the fact that there's not enough funding mm. for short form out there at the moment. Um, it's, it is really difficult. We did, when we did the Loop Fund, which was just for those three films, 5K each, we had 1,130 applications and it was only open for a month, so it is tricky. Um, I hope the flip side of that is that if people are turning ideas down, it's not because they hate you and they want you to die, it's usually like a capacity thing. Erica, how's it look um, with you, yeah, numbers? We get probably, um, I haven't quantified it just for shorts, but for all applications we get probably about 150 a month, so considerably less than random max, but still a lot, and of those, we probably commission maybe like 
one to two percent of them so again it's quite a depressing ratio but as Catherine says it's literally just a capacity mm. thing we're always going to unfortunately have to turn down things that are really amazing uh, just because of that's the way it is capacity wise unfortunately how many films have you made so far in the two years we've been running we've funded 34 films 34 yeah. um, how's um, looking at this? so for us across the fund because we fund features as well uh, Slightly depressing, but not maybe as depressing. Six percent, a bit better, uh, is what we fund over the applications. On our last shorts, we had 200 applications, um, and we funded 10 films. We're a bit different because we're not open and rolling, so mm. we were open for a month, and we do just for the shorts. It's one call a year. We do expect that to increase quite a lot because we have just kind of taken over the fund and and started at that point. Um, so this year, we imagine it it to be uh, higher numbers. Um, so it's a month from last Friday that it's open? Yeah, I, should, I was going to go, I should oh, have sorry. mentioned, yeah. the deadline is Tuesday the 9th um, of July at noon. Um, please get your applications in and get them in early. Um, it's really sad when we have crying filmmakers at 11am <laughs> on Tuesday morning. It's sad for us, it's sad for you, so just get them in before that. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah, but Tuesday the 9th of July, so it's yeah. just over a month. How about you, Charlie? How many um, do we get? In terms um, of numbers, yeah. Um, we get about 1,500 a year. 1,500. Um, and do sort of 20 to 25. And that's from all over the world. Um, and we don't have a deadline. We just keep taking them in mm. all the time. So, yeah, I'd really echo this thing that you I just have to turn down lots of stuff that you really like because there just isn't the capacity for it. Always not the right moment. And just on that, that's why I think, like, really planning your application and putting thought and time into it and really basic things like mm. it's really obvious for us when people have just copy and pasted a treatment and shoved it yeah. in the text boxes and then yeah. sho shoved us a treatment as well um, just like just take some time like for us you can preview our application online mm. um, so you can know what you're up against and the one the one minute video is that like a just a piece to camera or is yeah, it more, yeah 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 it's not it, not any more sophisticated than that no, no no please don't we're not judging your yeah. production values on that in any way <laughs> um it's uh, you know people shot on their phone or on their webcam yeah. um and that's really important i should mention that our films uh, as part of the bfi um have to pass a cultural test so uh, you know stories british stories or from british filmmakers or people living here in britain that are relevant to British audiences and international yeah. like yeah. yeah, okay, lovely. Um, I mean, I actually work in a slightly different way because after 13 years of being on the receiving end of a lot of um, proposals at Channel 4, uh, when I moved to commission at Real Stories, um, I decided to do it in a different way where I proactively went out to, um, to find filmmakers um, that had done interesting work. Um, and I've carried on the same thing at, um, at Red Bull, so I actually do it sort of the other way around. I don't have an open tender process. I, I just constantly out and about at places like this, looking at work and people that I think w would work well for the kind of thing that we're, we're looking for. Um, because sometimes you can just get kind of completely kind of swamped in the numbers and then you don't really do justice to the good ideas that are out there. Um, can we have another question, please? Yes, lady in the front row. We'll just wait for the mic in case uh, it's record being recorded, which it is actually, yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, question, I was thinking for Charlie, but actually maybe most of you could answer. Um, just at what stage in the projects do they come to you? So I saw, I watched, um, I think it's called The Island, mm. but it's also The Island of Hungry Ghosts as a feature film. And I watched it as a feature film and then I saw it was mm. there. So I'm assuming that was made as a feature and then maybe recut for The Guardian or somewhere done from the beginning. Yeah. Um, so just, just answering that last bit, that was an unusual one because they came to us really early in production for the feature and then asked if they could do a short or like pitched it as a specific standalone short. Um, we don't do that so much. Now, that was quite early in the life of, what, of the Strand. Now we're far more about original short commissions that are only supposed to be short. Um, we usually come in around late development because it has to be far enough along that you know what you want to do, but um, early enough that we can have a meaningful input on the film because we come on as exec producers and we're quite involved in helping you to steer it. Um, but there's no hard and fast rule. You can kind of come to us at, at 
any time. And like Black Sheep was very, very early. That was a concept stage. We've come on to other stuff when filmmakers have been shooting it for quite a long time and then we're just kind of coming in at the end. So it's, it's quite flexible, but late development's the ideal time. Yeah, and you've, you've been great to work with for us because I've uh, produced a couple of shorts that Charlie's yeah. kind of come on board later in, in life. And yeah, we will, yeah, and we will, we will very occasionally acquire a film. So um, both Fish Story and Lasting Marks, were, we came on really late because they, they're sort of the rare examples of films that were made, um, I suppose, for festivals or just sort of made for themselves, um, but really fit the brief that we're looking for without us having to really give many notes. For us, um, it's development production on the shorts, um, and it can be early development. Um, some people come to us with, with trays, teasers, trailers, they've gone out and filmed, um, but, and some of us come, they're kind of in their production process, but you, don't, you can still be in an early development stage, definitely, and as Charlie said, we, we come on board as execs, and, and we're involved in that creative process. Um, we need to know that you definitely have the story and the access. <laughs> Um, that, that's key to us, but it's, it's open. Is it similar for you, Erica? Yeah, well, ours is really varied as well. It tends to be later on, um, but we have actually development funded a couple of projects, only two mm -hmm. we've put some development money into and then have gone on to fully fund them. So you made both of them, the, the two developments went through Yes, the one of them is um, just starting production and the second one is almost finished and should hopefully be out very soon. That's also with the director of Little Pionier. Lovely. Yeah. Um, yes, Lucy. This is specifically for Erica and Catherine. Um, I'd like, you did speak a little bit about it more, but I'd like to hear more about it. Um, your distribution rights and whether you're happy to put it onto other online platforms um, and whether when it's online it can go into festivals and stuff like that. Um, so for, for us, we treat everything on a case-by-case -case basis. We don't take rights from filmmakers. So um, we believe ethically it's the filmmakers' right to do what they want with the film. But obviously, we want to have a meaningful conversation with them about hosting it, particularly if we've majority or fully funded the film, then we definitely love to be able to share it with our audience because we've put the money in because we care about the story. Um, but definitely festivals, yep, yeah, we will support with that. Um, and yeah, as I say, case by case basis, it really depends. Where does the Lush player come into it? Uh, so that's our, our platform that we have where we post the videos. So once a film's finished its festival run, um, then we can post it there. Sometimes the filmmaker just wants to get them out into the world right away, and sometimes it's all right for them to be online and depending on the festivals, different festivals have different kind of application processes. So we do work it out individually with the filmmakers at the time of drawing up the documents. Charlie, do you have, um, sorry, we'll come back to you in a second. Yeah. Do you have that kind of um, jostling around in terms of um, get online stuff going into festivals because it seems to be changing. But um, yeah, cool. yeah, we, we like to try and get our films into festivals before, before they go, they go online. online. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, we don't want to wait too long, but we're happy with them to play like world premiere and international European premiere. But um, it's pretty case by case, really. Mm. But the, the kind of films we're doing now are more geared towards a kind of festival style than they were before. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, um, so. The only real red line is that Random Acts do need uh, three-year UK TV broadcast rights. I mean, in practice, like you're probably not going to be in a bidding war with ITV and the BBC and Sun Sky, and like really regretting giving us the three-year UK TV broadcast rights. Um, so, and that's because so few broadcasters play films on TV. Um, with online, we tr we really do want the sort of thirty day premiere, and then after that, it's sort of up for grabs. And with festivals, what we find now is so many of them just don't are not that fussed if it's been online. Like so many of them are taking that approach that you're at a festival to see the taste of the curator, not to see a film just because they got it first. I should just add as well that the BFI um, do ask to put it on the post room, the BFI post room, which is part of the network. Um, again, it's a discussion with the mm. filmmakers about when that is, and it's non-exclusive. Mm. What festivals have you seen that have kind of shifted their position recently as to I whether... I think Sundance played Fish Story after we'd been online. I think yeah. that's right. Do you remember? 
Uh, no, that was, that was before online, oh, right. I think. But yeah, we haven't found, because most random acts, because our sort of turnaround is quite quick, we want to get them out there while they're sort of still relevant. I don't think there's been many festivals that have sort of said, oh, we love the film, but can you take it off the internet? Um, I think people worry about that a little bit more than they need to, but maybe yeah. a festival director could sort of stick their hand up and contradict that. I don't the only know. thing I'd say about this, sorry, is I think that's totally true for films of, of like a random acts length. I definitely think it's not true for films of the length we're doing because mm -hmm. um, it's so competitive around like 20 minute films that festivals are still going to prefer a premiere. Mm -hmm. But it's definitely true for shorter. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay, lovely. Um, some more questions, please. Yes, there's a lady at the back, right at the back. Hiya, um, this is a question for all of you and you may have touched on it quite briefly but in terms of when you're getting applications and those briefs like you said that um, sometimes people are submitting like um, sizzle reels or like teaser trailers and that kind of thing um, and yeah in terms of like shooting on smartphone and stuff like that I always wonder like when you're submitting those kinds of things you said you weren't looking for like production value and sometimes I just wonder like because you are going into film and it's like a visual thing and you're doing it on your smartphone, I just worry that like the, the sizzle reel is like showing where I'm at right now and what I could do with more money and like more time and more support and stuff like that. But I just wonder like how you judge those things because obviously you don't want to submit something that's kind of like ropey. Like you said you didn't judge it for production value, but I'm, I suppose I'm asking what you are judging it for. Can I just sort um, of clarify that because yeah. that was very specifically for that application. Right. Um, that for was that, for the for one minute video. It's a one, yeah. Right, that okay. Doesn't, that doesn't actually apply to the yeah. teaser mm. and taster. Like, we definitely will be judging those things on production value and style and tone, and that is our first introduction to you as a filmmaker. You're, well, maybe our first introduction to you as a filmmaker and your style and tone. So, um, yeah, no, that was just for the one minute video, for okay. the specifics. Which is right. like a filmmaker talking to camera. So, beyond that, um, It'd be interesting to hear the sort of different mm. takes on it. I, I mean, my, my, a couple of things that I would say is um, I have commissioned whole series at Channel 4 off the back of sizzle reels that were made on mobile phones. Um, having said that, we, the um, short form program BAFTA this year, um, the award went to a film that was entirely shot on a mobile phone. So, um, you know, it's, it's not really a sort of... Uh, quality issue uh, that you've shot it on a phone. Uh, and, and one thing I would say is that at this juncture, if you're ever sending in a sort of proposal for anything anywhere that doesn't have any video in it, you should really be stopping to ask yourself why, because it's, um, you know, it's so easy to do and it's so essential, as you said, to the sort of audiovisual world that this is actually in. That, you know, it's a kind of a weird thing to submit anything anywhere without any video. What's your take on um, scissor reels and stuff, John? Yeah, we, we generally always want to see one unless it was completely impractical, like your subject is on the other side of the world. Um, and you should try and make it look as good as possible because we are going to, that's, if we don't know your work, we are going to use that to judge your visual sensibility. Um, and if you absolutely can't send us a teaser for this film, then send us some previous work. Um, as long as it's representative of the style of this film. Sometimes people write and say, oh, I'm sending this to you, but this isn't, like the film I'm making isn't gonna look like this at all. And that's not very useful to us. We want, we, we need to see what it's gonna look like. And that's just in the context that we get so many submissions. So you're always gonna elevate the ones where you look at the trailer and go, oh, that's amazing. But I mean, sometimes even just having third party Third party footage of a protagonist would yeah. be something better than nothing. Well, yeah, or them filming themselves, yeah. anything like that. It's, it's generally possible to send us something. Because we're also looking for a bit proof of access as well, and proof of your, the charisma of your character. Yeah. Just as a counterpoint, I don't look at reels um, from directors because I think if you've got an amazing editor and a zippy pop track, like you can make mm. something that looks 
wonderful out of a fairly unexciting back catalogue. For a yeah. director, I would always just look, want to look at one really relevant film mm. in its entirety. Um, ra- I, uh, yeah, yeah showreels yeah. are really show, weird. Yeah. I never, I don't like it if people send me showreels. Teaser trailers or previous work. Yeah. 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 Sure. So, I mean, for uh, an editor or a DOP, reels are great. Yeah. Because yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm yeah. thinking, yeah. But like, thinking not more, for a director. Yeah. <laughs> just sort of thinking more about sizzle reels here, really. So mm. how, how about you and the... For, for us, yeah, for the actual sort of you know beyond that one minute video. Yeah, we would uh, definitely if if you've gone and shot and you've got footage of, of the subject of the film, if you're in that process, we definitely want to be seeing that. And as Charlie said, and as I mentioned, if if we don't know you as a filmmaker, that is our first introduction to your work. Um, it's not completely vital for us for you to have gone and shot with this story but previous work is then the complement to that. Yeah. And as Charlie said in, in you know, style and tone um, that you plan to make this next film with. Another thing uh, nobody's really touched on here because we're talking about raising funds is that unfortunately sometimes it's worth it to make that investment yourself and spend a little money to have some production value. Certainly with like a crowdfunding video, if it's just you with a webcam talking about why your idea is great, it's not gonna garner much interest. But if you, you know, create a budget and create something stimulating and exciting and informative, um, that money then comes back to you because that's what they're judging you on. Is the video is the most important aspect, I think. Yeah, yeah that's true. We had a, fun, a crowdfunded film called Beyond Clueless that played here a few years ago. It's the first film I ever got involved with. And the teaser for that, I think, was actually a little animation. Like, the film wasn't an animation, but it just sort of showed that you put the effort in, um, mm. which I think is what you want to know from mm. a filmmaker who is asking you for their money as a crowdfunding campaign. Mm. Mm. And to add another layer to things from a brand perspective, I don't know if um, other brands are the same, but certainly for us, the panellists that look at the applications, so I'll bring them in, but most of the panel that look at these applications aren't film people. They are finance people or brand people, so seeing something that that can that they have right in front of them that's really clear to show them how that idea is going to come to life is really helpful for people who maybe aren't used to picking apart treatments and things mm. like that, so it's, that's really helpful for us as well. Mm. Good. Um, some more questions, please. Yes, there's a, a lady at the back. Just wondered um, how important the sound design is for your scenario? I think sound design is 51% once again, <laughs> of, of the presentation. I mean, it, it sets the tone and the mood. And I'll tell you right now, if you hear somebody with an amateur sound and it's like crackling, poppy, or not crisp, it really turns people off. So definitely recommend that you get nice recording, nice mics, maybe put in a little bit of atmosphere, something, you know, just to give people the mood and the, the world that you're trying to create. Yeah. That's certainly stuff that you're shooting on um, on mobiles, that's the place to sort of splash out a bit in terms of getting some decent um, mics and also maybe some sort of stabilisation, but that's all sort of dirt cheap, but it's worth mm. doing. So you don't have that kind of barrier of crappy audio or yeah. bouncy picture. But also just saying when you're aware that something isn't the way it would be in the final film, like if someone sends me something and they haven't sort of shown that they sort of haven't said, well, obviously this would be mixed totally differently and blah, 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 then you can sort of take on board those caveats. I think it's if people sort of say, here it is, it's brilliant, this is almost like it would be when it's finished, that, that might be a danger sign. Yeah. yeah, I'd just say on that point, like, very good sound recording and, like, that you've thought about it in music, but I'm, I'm not, we're not expecting you to have gone through a full sound design and mix at that point. Um, but, yeah, definitely to have thought about and if it's not going to be as you mentioned, exactly how it will be, just to point that out. Right, just very briefly to round off, because we've kind of um, more or less hit the end of time, but could each of you just give us a bit of um, kind of a top tip uh, for short form from your perspective for, for the audience here? You start with you, Charlie. Um, yeah. I <laughs> think just really try and find something that feels like it's not been told and feels really original and feels like something that you genuinely feel only you have unearthed and only you have access to. And it may not actually, that may not actually be the case, there may be other people working on similar things, but just really trying to think of something that feels totally unique to you will make a big difference to us, certainly. Um, 
I've stolen my line. No, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. Think about your visual, your visual approach and your style um, as a filmmaker, um, and really as why it's important, why this story is important for you, and why you're the right person to tell it. Yeah, again, brilliant advice, but I think <laughs> something that you're really passionate about as well, because I can really tell when a director comes in mm. and if the story really means something to them and they have this real burning passion to make it, I think that that really sets those directors above from the rest, if it's something you truly are passionate about. Yeah, I think everyone's had great answers, um, and hearing all these words uh, are, are they're sometimes a bit hard to embody. Like, I remember the word I heard at, like, a Creative England uh, scheme thing was, like, of uh, conviction, have conviction. And I was kind of like, I've got conviction. I was writing the word conviction in my application like 20 times. But I think <laughs> my top tip is, I know all the questions have mostly been addressed to the people that you want money from. But if, if you find that route frustrating or demoralizing, then an empowered, empowering approach you can take is to just put your idea out there, you know, start it up as a blog form or however you like, and share some of your pre-visualizations. You don't need to invest a whole lot and share your idea with the world because there's a community there. There's one of the biggest tips from crowdfunding is cross promotion. So you reach out, you, you spread your feelers out to every single person that is currently live. And if you start to have a bit of followers, and one of my other tips there is you can be giving people one pound coins and saying, can you donate this one pound coin? So you're not a person on the street asking for money. You're a person saying, will you donate my coin? You get a few, a few uh, hundred followers, let's say. So there's your hundred, couple hundred pound donations of your own money invested. And then now when you're sharing with other crowdfunding campaigns, they see you as a source of followers and they want to cross promote. So they start advertising your project, you start advertising their project and you start to share backers. And that's my big tip there from the share communities. Short emails. <laughs> <That's it. laughs> Give people the gift of time. A short email is a blessing. And I think I'd round it off just by saying that this kind of a uh, bit of a sort of default thing that happens with um, unscripted short form, which is these kind of mini character portraits. And they, they kind of work quite often, um, but they're not very ambitious and they're not too exciting. Um, so I'm a bit of a sort of narrative merchant and I'm a real kind of advocate of stuff that is actually a story, mm. uh, even if it's a simple story, but something that's driven by narrative. Anyway, I'm afraid the lights are flashing, the time is out. Um, thank you very much for um, coming and contributing and listening so carefully um, and making it um, really enjoyable event. So thanks very much. And thanks for all the time.